We're going to jump into part two of our series on tracking a rock song with Nate Washburn. And before I just showed you the footage that Nate and I shot, I wanted to preface what you're going to see just a little bit to try to set this up. This is part of a pretty long conversation, and so I've decided to divide it into at least two and possibly three videos because there's just so much content and I didn't really want to put out a 40 minute video where we are having kind of a back and forth dialogue, pretty casual conversation about what it's like to track drums in a band and also what it's like to track drums if you are producing yourself. And so Nate and I are going to talk about both of those topics, what it's like to get the best performance out of a band and what to do if you are recording yourself and you make a mistake. And we are actually going to highlight a small mistake that Nate made because I wasn't here at the studio while he was tracking the drums for the song. He was here by himself and he wanted to go ahead and get something done. And so we talk about a mistake that he made and how he was able to fix the mistake that he made. And so that's gonna be applicable to you if you are producing yourself, or maybe even if you are producing another band because mistakes happen. This is recording. Sometimes you have to figure out and know how to fix something that got looked over in the tracking process. And then at the end of the video, we're gonna to start to hear some of the drum sounds. Now, what we did not do in this video was have a deep dive discussion about the mics and the preamps and the compressors and go through all of the technical details. This is a philosophical conversation that is designed to help you think about what it's like to produce a song like this on your own, or if you're an artist, it gives you an inside look at what a producer like Nate thinks about when they approach recording the drums. So if you're looking for that kind of information, what you can do is go back to producing a country song, the part where Goldman and I talk about the drum setup and the microphones that I used, because we literally took the same setup that Goldman and I used for the country record that I'm producing with Anderson Ellswick, and then we went a little bit harder with things like the compression and the EQ, but only a little bit. We used the same mic package, the same drums, and the same outboard pieces of equipment, compressors and EQs. So they are very similar sounding, but Nate's drums are more aggressive because it's a rock song. So here's the conversation, enjoy. What I wanna do first is talk about the, the technical side of things just really briefly, because people are gonna want to know what we did to get these drum sounds. And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I want to spend more time on talking about the things that you did to fit them in this song. And so yeah. just as a really brief overview, we started with actually the drums were still set up from a couple of weeks ago when Matt and I tracked the drums for the country EP uh, that you can watch. And you can watch that video on the YouTube channel. And some of the things that I did as you were playing the drums for this song to help get them to sound a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more rocking, was just go through and like, you know, when, when Goldman and I tracked those drums, the snare had a distressor on it to compress, but it was very, very, very lightly. Um, and with this song, I was, as, as we were tracking, I was compressing pretty hard. We also, um, we tuned the snare, you tuned the snare up quite a bit from where it was at when you found it on the floor. So that's, that's another thing. So it's tonally, it's different. Um, the overheads were not in the same position as they were when Matt and I were doing the song. And so we just, we used a cable, measured them equidistant from each other, uh, from the center of the snare. And uh, everything else was basically the same with the exception of we added a hallway mic. Is I think the one microphone that we added to this that uh, Goldman and I didn't use when we tracked the drums for the country song. And then other than that, you did some things as we were going back and forth, you did some things on the console to tweak and get um, the EQ sounding a little bit different on probably a couple of the room mics and the outside kick, I think. Yeah, I think so. My outside kick, I usually don't EQ. You like to EQ your outside yeah. kick, and so that's just that's just simply a taste thing. I don't think there was really anything technical to talk about there, unless you just want to talk about some of the moves that you kind of make when you're doing that. I, it is maybe still on here, but I, I don't recall exactly what the move would have been, but typically with a kick drum, 
Uh, I want it to sound as close to like what I envision the final version of the drums will be. You know what I mean? The, sure. I want the kick sound to match what's in my head for what the mix will sound like. As close as we can get. I'm not usually the type of person who, who goes, well, this is just the very natural sound of the kick and later I'll sculpt it. Of course, that's going to happen in a mix. Like anytime you're mixing, you're you're carving out stuff that you don't need so that you can make room for all the other millions of tracks you have in the song. But you know, for in, in this situation, we have a kick out mic that was really boomy, and even just by dropping it in on the console and driving the preamp, it actually tightened up the low end. So that was the main thing I did was. It was going to a different pre. We moved it to the console, and I drove the mic a little harder, and that actually, just from that, cleaned up some of the low end. And then I actually added a little bit low end back in and took out a little bit of mid-range. So that's about it that I did on the on the outside kick. And then the front kick, I also came in here and, and EQ'd a little differently um, on the outboard gear. So... And we can talk about that didn't end up mattering, but <laughs> we can, and we can talk about why, but uh, that is those little moves were some of the only moves I made just because I was the one playing the drums and not dialing in the sound. Okay, so that's the technical part of this that I think we need to focus on. We don't really need to talk about a ton of stuff. Same mics. If you want to see more of that stuff, you can go back and check out the other video because it's literally the exact same microphone package for the entire thing and the console and preamps and everything that we used is is identical. We just made a few tweaks to get a little more aggressive, a little more rock sounded from the get-go. But you, there's a couple of things that happened when you were tracking this that I think are probably important to talk about because I think um, even though, you know, if you're in a real situation where the band was out there and was doing the drumming, you would have caught this, you would have fixed it on the fly. But it's the kind of thing where if you're producing yourself, you might run into this sort of thing and need to fix it. And so I think it's good to, for people to hear what you did to fix the sort of mistake that happened. You went off to do some live mixing and I was like, I'm just gonna loop this and hopefully get some drums that are close to what I need for the song. Um, and which means I can't be in here engineering and like dialing everything in perfectly and performing and playing the drums at the same time. So a couple things happened. Maybe after like the second or third take, the uh, the front kick mic or the inside kick mic just fell off the stand. It just happened before. It has happened to the best, probably some of the best engineers ever. It happens all the time. Um, normally you just go, oh, that happened. Sure. Like, kick sounds different now. You know what I mean? I didn't have that because I was just sitting there trying to like power through. I'm not. I'm not good at the drums, so. This was just me struggling, me trying to get a, a, a satisfactory drum take. So you can see here, I've comped the take. Here's where the kick, you know, this is an earlier take that I used for the verse. Looks like the kick was fine. And then here in the intro, it fell down. Over here, it fell down. So I have a, a mostly unused, uh, you know, I, I basically just turned this way down. Um, it's it's not really audible. So what I ended up doing then is triggering the outside kick so I could add a sample that's more of that punchy, like attacky inside kick sound, which I normally would not do uh, until the mix. If I was gonna do that at all, it would be at the, at the very start of the mix process. Um, I don't feel like having uh, a samples dropped in on your drums is important when you're tracking, you know, sure. unless the drums just sound bad and you need that to, you know, I, not everyone has access to like great sounding drums and great sounding drum room. So I'm not saying that you can't do it that way. It's just like, I never do it that way. So, sure. but for this, because I was actually out there playing the drums and no one was in here actually manning the Pro Tools rig, then yeah, this little <laughs> mistake happened, which not the end of the world. Dropped in a sample. Um, that's the sort of the main kick sound that you're hearing. And I tried to blend it enough so it doesn't sound like super fake. I hate that that really super fake kind of sound. So hopefully it, it doesn't. Like what is real plasticky? Yeah, hopefully it doesn't sound like that. I used like just some kick samples that I had made on some other project. So 
it's not like it's some crazy hyped, you know, like Metallica drum, you know, sample that I ripped off of a cassette tape or something like that. But, um, and then while I was doing that, I also did the snare, which once again, I would pretty much never do at this point, but I did it because uh, just sort of my workflow when I'm doing samples, I'll just do them all at the same time. So yeah, couple samples on the drums at the moment. I don't think that they're make or break, especially just considering we're just trying to track the song. Um, but th that is in there and that's just to supplement the loss of the <laughs> kick so mic. Obviously we, we've talked about, you did it because we needed to supplement the loss of the kick mic and a couple of the things that you were comping in to the, to the main take. But do you ever, um, I think you said this actually maybe a second ago, but you don't, you don't ever do the sample layering in when you're, when you're recording, tracking a song with a band. The reason I'm asking too is because depending on the stuff that I'm doing, definitely for a country thing, I would not. But I have done a few rock songs where I want the, I want the band to, to, to be in the song the whole time. I never want to get that. I know you and I have talked about this before. I never want to get that comment of like, you know, is it going to sound that way when it's mixed? I want them to just be into the creative process. So my my way of getting to there is a lot of times I will, as soon as the drums are tracked, I'm dropping samples in just to make sure that the drums sound super punchy if it's a rock thing. I am not against that in any way because because your main point, I think, is essential. I don't want there to be any point where I'm working with the band where they sort of look at each other and go like, well, I hope it doesn't sound like this, you know. I hope this isn't the final sound. Yeah, I yeah. hate that. I th I remember the first time I ever made a record, like uh, on my not not uh, as a producer, but just as a musician. You know, I was like 18 years old, and just sitting down, and be like, "Is this what it's gonna sound like?" You know what I mean? Because it's just some crummy studio in the middle of nowhere, um, and it's just such a defeatist feeling, and and not indicative of what the type of product I'm trying to put out. So if that needs to happen, it absolutely can. Because it can really eject you from the creative process as a musician. The technical stuff shouldn't be above the emotional stuff as far as like capturing performances. Cool. So whatever whatever needs to happen to like bring the band into it, I, I'm not opposed to it. I just do things a certain way. And like I said earlier about how I was EQing the kick, I'm really trying to EQ the kick to the sound of the song from the get-go. I'm not trying to, uh, I, I would rather ruin the kick sound by over-EQing it <laughs> than to just not EQ it and have it be this really wide open thing if, if, that's, if that's the sound of the song. And you're talking about when you're sitting down, you've got the guide track of the guitar done, you're tracking drums with a band, drummer's out there in the hot seat, you're ready to start going and doing takes. You're talking about, you're trying to, EQ the sounds and maybe you'll you'll even risk over baking the sound of certain drums to try to get the song to sound the way that you hear that it should be in your head because of the pre-production and the creative decisions that you've already made. You kind of are approaching it with a, I've got this thing in mind and that's what I'm going to shoot for as we track it. I don't like to play it safe. Um, and that sounds like, that makes me sound really edgy and that's not the point. It, it's more just that, uh, t because there's so much technology, like if, if the kick sound ends up sounding like too EQ'd or something like, yeah, you, you can still just drop in a sample that sounds how you want it. Uh, but I, I'm not a big fan of just like leaving everything super pristine and like untouched, you know, like this is just the pure you know, colorless EQ, colorless preamps. Like I just, that's just not exciting to me. I'm at a point in my career where I can trust my ears enough to make those decisions and be happy with them. And you know, if you mess up, you suffer the consequences and you fix it, you know? Sure. Um, I, that's, that's my philosophy for that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to play it super safe. Uh, it's just not exciting. So show me some drum sounds. Let's just listen to some of the drum sounds that you got for this. And then I've got a couple of other questions that I want to talk about, about, uh, about how you would talk to and coach a drummer through a part like this. All right, here's some drums from the top.
Okay, um, just to illustrate a couple things, I'm just going to play uh, a little passage, and I'm going to uh, mute the samples so you can just hear kind of what the samples are doing. So the kick sample is doing a lot, Yeah. right? And part of that is because the inside kick mic would be doing a lot most of the time for, right. for the type of drum sound I'm going for. So that would really be the primary sound that I would use. And because the mic fell down, we're using the sample sound. So then here's a, I'll, I'll, t I'll turn off the snare sample. This is not nearly as drastic. Like I said, this I only did because I'm so used to doing any sample I need to do in the song, I'll just do it all, all at one time. That's just how my mix workflow goes. So I don't even know that I thought about it. I just made the snare sample because it's just what I do. So gotcha. um, here's without it. Something. It's not doing a ton. It's right. just doing a little bit. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and this would be something where when I go to mix the song, I may not use that sample at all. I have no idea. The I, I like the way the snare sounds a lot that we did. It's the snare we've I've recorded hundreds of times. So I know the snare really well, and it always sounds great. So it could be, and honestly, there's not a ton of bleed. So it could be something where as I mix the song, I just go, yeah, I don't need the sample. Or I might use the sample to trigger a, like a, reverb i may use it to duck the hall so that that you know or to open the gate of a hall the hall mic or something you know i may i may use it for something else oh right so that you're not basically having like splatty sound and cymbals between the snare totally. hits, but you can get the whatever the hall is doing to the to the room mic is what you're i'm talking not about. saying i will do that i'm just saying you it's can i can do yeah. whatever i don't know what i'm gonna do that's for the future version of me to solve that problem <laughs>